Ten years ago, the idea of an Asia Democracy Network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force spanning over 30 countries in Asia. Through the support and solidarity of our members and partners, our journey has been a testament to resilience and unwavering dedication to a brighter future. A network that was started to celebrate and sustain the democracy wins of Asia has now become a vital space for advocates to gather in solidarity to defend against the regression of democracy. Despite the challenges encountered along the way and what waits for us in the future, our commitment to the development of inclusive governance, human rights, equality, and the promotion of free and fair elections remains steadfast. ADN has prioritized regional solidarity building through building consolidation and consensus on the national level and prioritizing youth leadership and movement cultivation. As we reflect on our milestones and the path ahead, we invite you to join us in our commitment to democracy and the shared values that drive our everyday endeavor. Together, some of you have may arrive early in the morning, but yeah, we are glad to see all of you here today. Some, I can see some familiar faces, of course, the Malaysians. And of course, they, we have friends from Indonesia, Thailand, and all over Asia and beyond. Once again, Selamat Datang, Sawadee Cup, and welcome to Bangkok. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are here today for the 10th anniversary and the 10th summit or conference of Asia Democracy Network. This is the 10th year. Some of you who have been joining uh, may have joined the Asia Democracy Network Conference over the years and some of you probably joining for the first time. Just to give a little brief of ADN, ADN is a group of network of civil society and institutions across Asia and beyond. So with that, uh, okay, before that is just to share with you, we will have a conference for two days which have started yesterday for pre-discussion and workshops and today we will have the normal for every conference, speeches, but also there will be panel discussion and followed by later tonight a solidarity dinner and tomorrow as well, right? Uh, my name is Mandip, I'm from Malaysia. I'm tasked to be the MC by Ichal, my old friend. I can't say no, or else he won't invite me here. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite the Secretary General of Asia Democracy Network, Mr. Ichal Supriyadi, for the opening speech. Don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, we are in van of democracy and human rights. We celebrate different opinion. Everybody remain calm. Please be seated. This is an NGO event, a democracy, and we celebrate diverse view. Ichal, the stage is yours. Check. Check. Can I start this morning? Who's the lady? Joseph? Can I invite you a moment of silence to remembering Gaza? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> All right. All right. Joseph. Hello, guys. <laughs> You have, a, you, you have a moment for that. Uh, thank you so much for the expression. Let's give a big round of applause. It's very interesting. We have a show on the stage, and we also have dynamics on the corridor or in the foyers. 
I think votes are equally welcome in the climates of democracy. Let's give a round of applause for those expressions which will be presented on the stage and also in the corridors. Let's give them all a round of applause. So every expression are welcome here, but also we need to respect others' interests and here. So we all here try our best to reflect the voices of civil society, the voices of democracy, but if there are some, uh, some objections, I think this is the space and also the opportunity for you to express that still respecting other peoples. But let me start my speech by calling everyone to have a moment of silence, to remembering, to respecting the lost life in Gaza, in Myanmar, and many others, our friends, the democracy and human rights defenders who are struggles from exile and also still in the jails. So may I invite everybody to stand and then pay maybe 30 seconds of silence to rememberings and hope things are getting better. The moment silence is start. Silent is end. I have a text actually, but with these dynamics, I would like to change <laughs> and try to make sense my speech with the dynamics happening here. So let me extend my warm welcome and greetings for everyone here, mostly representing different civil society organizations, member of parliaments, think tanks, and academic communities, including donors, institution, diplomatic communities, I hope they are not fierce to come here now, <laughs> and also the distinguished dignitaries who I cannot mention all. I can see many friends of human rights defenders, democracy defenders, who I've been knowing them when I was still young, they're already fighting. So I'm considered the third generation of ADNs after my seniors here, uh, Secretary General, Oh, I can see Dr. Shin was the first, and Anselmo somewhere as a second uh, secretary general. So actually, this assembly is a space for all of us who is values democracy and human rights. Despite us coming from different sectors and backgrounds, we are here to unite in our effort to promote and protect democracy in the various spaces that we occupy. What happening today in the uh, front stage and behind the stage is evidence that this forum is welcoming any expressions. But we should not burn by those spirits, but try to nurture and manage the energy for lobby to negotiate and also to, to, to pursue uh, a good point to move forward for democracy. This assembly mandated by the last year's Bali assembly that concerns and committed for, for four uh, uh, priority areas, which is we wanted to protect things, democracy processes and democracy institutions, which continuously face attack everywhere. We wanted to enable multifaceted consolidations and solidarity for democracy promotions and protections. Promoting free media and free expressions amid a war of narrative happenings. And then the last is supporting youth leadership and intergenerational understandings. So lastly, I would like to end up my opening speech by saying, we are at the same page for those who are suffering. If I would like to choose, I also would like to be in different stage. But I have to be here. I have to navigate things, the negotiation, the promotions, and further enhancements of consolidation democracy by we try as much as possible to involving peoples 
states, and many other groups. So we would like to thank the contribution of everyone who are with us to committed and ensuring the success of these events. From those who have been with us through the conceptualization and planning to everyone here, all endeavoring to ensure a fruitful and vibrant cross-pollination of ideas. The diverse faces we have here paint a picture of our Asian democratic traditions that is colorful, unwavering, united, and strong. Don't question our commitments. We will be with you, right? And then let's join hand to power up the democracy movement. Long live people, long live democracy, and thank you so much. Thank you, Ichal. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause again to Ichal. <clears throat> As mentioned by Ichal, our conference today, we have around 250 participants from 30 different countries, which involve 181 institutions or civil society from Asia and beyond. So, this is one of if not, the biggest gathering of civil society actors, Democrats, activists, and you know, uh, we have artists and etc. from Asia. Once again, welcome to Bangkok. Uh, know something from our friends in this room. I hope left. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for your speech. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, this is an event of democracy and solidarity. So we cherish all the views, all the act, as long as it's peace. And for those of you here, remain calm. I believe all of you have gone through this, whether on the street or in a room. But again, we celebrate democracy where what we preach for so relax it's normal this is thailand this is democracy <laughs> with that i will we will now show a short video for this conference
For the next event, after two speeches and some beautiful, uh, you know, beautiful act, um, we will now invite a group of a Burmese artist or Burmese activist who is based here in Thailand, who use creative activism. Has some of us will have a different approach, whether it's protests, whether it's submitting memorandum, meetings, lobbying, etc. But our friends from Burmese who are based here, they use music as an art to, you know, uh, to share their inspiration, to share their struggle from our friends who is in Myanmar. As we all know, friends in Myanmar over the years, I will not say three years, probably over 30 years, they've been fighting for democracy and a better Myanmar. So here we have a group of activists, artists who are based in Thailand, who will be performing and their music and their songs are actually inspired uh, and to promote the struggle in Myanmar. So without further ado, I would like to invite Co-Culture Assemble for their performance. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for them.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Co Culture. Let's give the loudest round of applause to our friends from Myanmar. <laughs> Democracy is a journey. To fight for freedom is also a journey. And there are many ways that we can send out our message. There's many ways we can push out our agenda. And of course, music and arts is one of the mechanism that we can use. While I was watching the performance, there was a line that dictatorship must end. And yes, we are here today to ensure dictatorship will end, not only in Asia, but all over the world and the rise of democracy. Can we do all together? Yes? Yes or not? Yes, but it's a journey that, you know, like Ichal mentioned, you know, it started many, many years ago. Now we are here today. And a friend of mine in Malaysia always told me that, you know, to fight for a better democracy and human rights is difficult. And because it's difficult, we are doing this job. And because it's difficult, we are here today to share our ideas, to build our networks and ensure that one day, hopefully one day, we will see Myanmar, Palestine, Cambodia and other countries is free and the restore of democracy and human rights. Without further ado, I will now, we will now show you a video, a last, promise you a last speech for the morning by... Dr. Jose Ramos Horta, the president of Timor Leste and also a Nobel Prize recipient. Uh, dear friends of Asia Democracy Network, I know each and every one of you. I have had the pleasure, the privilege of hosting you in Timor Leste, of meeting you uh, in the region in different circumstances. So I regret that uh, I don't have the 
pleasure, the privilege of being in Bangkok with you, but I send you my warmest greetings from Dili, Timor-Leste. I'm taping this on a Sunday morning in my home. Uh, I would start by saying, uh, repeating uh, what you know. Fortunately, Timor-Leste, we are living in peace, uh, tranquility, I wouldn't say full-fledged perfectionist democracy, but uh, we are rated uh, number one in Southeast Asia. Some of you or some uh, cynicals might say, well, not too difficult to be number one democracy in Southeast Asia. Uh, we are rated number 10 in terms of press freedom, number 10 in the world by reporters without borders. We have a zero political violence. We have a zero ethnic base or religious base violence. So we are very proud of that. We are not uh, equally good in economics, in delivering to our people, but we are doing our best because democracy has to deliver. Democracy has to deliver well-being to the people. We have uh, to feed the people, the poor, the hungry, the malnourished. We have to eliminate child malnutrition, too high in Timor-Leste. We still have a very high rate of uh, extreme poverty and particularly of stunt stunting and uh, uh, child mortality and mother mortality. The next five years, I hope myself, Prime Minister Shanana Wismo, and everybody else around us, including opposition, international partners, civil society, NGOs, we work together towards elimination of extreme poverty, elimination of child malnutrition, stunting, elimination of mothers, uh, 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 mortality rate uh, that is high, maternal mortality rate, infant mortality rate, more protection of women, more uh, protection of LGBT community, more uh, equity, more equality for all. But I move on to uh, Myanmar. That's my main concern in terms of foreign policy. From long, long time, I first went to Myanmar, as many of you know, in July 94, to conduct the first ever human rights and diplomacy training program for more than 100 people at the time in Karen territory. Ever since, I have uh, known Myanmar, deeply sympathized with them, uh, deeply pained by their suffering and my frustration with inability to do more. In the UN General Assembly uh, past September, I think I was the only head of state who emphatically spoke about the situation in Myanmar. And as I have won uh, foreign leaders, and I have expressed publicly in the media, the military are losing control of the situation. NUG, the National Army, control about 60% of the territory. And that's why the military using more air force helicopter to indiscriminately bomb any moving object uh, on the ground. And the recent admission by the military that the country can fall apart, can fragment. Yes, I have won this as recently as a few weeks ago. The risk for Myanmar is that uh, the military will collapse, but then there may be a unified central political alternative, political power to hold everybody together and to hold the country together. This is what we have to be concerned about. This is what NUG and everyone involved in the pro-democracy movement have to be concerned about. Not only winning the war, winning the politics, keeping the country together. Uh, and that you can do only by reaching out to those who, on the other side, feel they are defeated. I know it's very positive the appeal made by NUG to reassure the military, those in Myanmar, the military, who defect that no one will be treated unfairly. There will be no persecution, no revenge. And I urge the military in Myanmar, Please do not continue to kill your own people. 
These are your own people, women and children, youth. They are children of the country, your own children. Give up, surrender to the liberation forces. They will not harm you. You will be part of the victory of the country, victory of the democracy in Myanmar. This is what happened in other situations, happened in Portugal. After 50 years of dictatorship, where the military young officer rose up, overthrew the colonial fascist dictatorship in Portugal, and freed, began the freedom of Portuguese colonies in Africa. So, and uh, follow, look at the example of Indonesia. What a fantastic transition to democracy in Indonesia. Long gone the Suharto era with the old too powerful the Indonesian military. They themselves transition to a modern army that protects the democracy. I understand there are concerns about setbacks of democracy in the world. Yes, there are setbacks of democracy as the setbacks of uh, dictatorship. Look at Brazil, a great case that illustrates that. When Lula was first arrested and persecuted, I was the only voice in the world of any known personality who spoke out denouncing the travesty of justice in Brazil, defending Lula's integrity. Well, he's back in office and I went to his inauguration January 1st, 2023. So democracy can return after a setback. There are setbacks for democracy, there are setbacks for dictatorship, for autocracy. Life goes on, the struggle goes on, dear friends. Continue to do the marvelous work you've been doing all these years. For Timor-Leste, for Indonesia, for Philippines, for Thailand, for Myanmar. You bless people. I thank you for your friendship, your solidarity, and I wish all of you, not only all of you at the conference, but all of you across Southeast Asia, that we continue the work towards democracy, wherever you are, but always with wisdom, always with intelligence, always with pragmatism, without arrogance, with humility, to build better lives, a better region, of Southeast Asia, region of fraternity, a better Asia for all of us, for the four billion people that inhabit this extremely rich, diversified, very diverse region of the world, this great Asia. God bless you and much success in your gathering. Thank you. Thank you, His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta, the President of Republic of Timor Leste. Okay, now we will take a 20 minutes coffee break, and before that, wait. Before that, okay, as you walk out from the room later, there will there are a lot of photos exhibition, where it is curated by Lady Liberty of Hong Kong which is an artist who have collected the, the photos of the Hong Kong protests which held in 2019 and 2020. This is uh, part of their uh, program or part of how they promote the issues of Hong Kong. And there's also Democracy Struggle Southeast Asia exhibit, which is curated by C Junction. C Junction is a Thai foundation that is established to foster understanding and to appreciate Southeast Asia in all so Okay, there's additional information. <laughs> right? So, please have a look of all the exhibition there. Take photos and if you post on social media, please use hashtag ADA20 two, three on Instagram, uh, X, Facebook, or any other platform. 
And for those of you who haven't registered, please register yourself outside there or else we will not allow you to come in after coffee break. No, I'm just kidding. But please register. Thank you. See you in 20 minutes time. Ten years ago, the idea of an Asia Democracy Network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force spanning over 30 countries in Asia. Through the support and solidarity of our members and partners, our journey has been a testament to resilience and unwavering dedication to a brighter future. A network that was started to celebrate and sustain the democracy wins of Asia has now become a vital space for advocates to gather in solidarity to defend against the regression of democracy. Despite the challenges encountered along the way and what waits for us in the future, our commitment to the development of inclusive governance, human rights, equality, and the promotion of free and fair elections remains steadfast. ADN has prioritized regional solidarity building through building consolidation and consensus on the national level and prioritizing youth leadership and movement cultivation. As we reflect on our milestones and the path ahead, we invite you to join us in our commitment to democracy and the shared values that drive our everyday endeavor. Together, let us illuminate the way forward, ensuring that the flame of democracy burns ever brighter. Ten years ago, the idea of an Asia Democracy Network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN 
was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force spanning over 30 countries in Asia. Through the support and solidarity of our members and partners, our journey has been a testament to resilience and unwavering dedication to a brighter future. A network that was started to celebrate and sustain the democracy wins of Asia has now become a vital space for advocates to gather in solidarity to defend against the regression of democracy. Despite the challenges encountered along the way and what waits for us in the future, our commitment to the development of inclusive governance, human rights, equality, and the promotion of free and fair elections remains steadfast. ADN has prioritized regional solidarity building through building consolidation and consensus on the national level and prioritizing youth leadership and movement cultivation. As we reflect on our milestones and the path ahead, we invite you to join us in our commitment to democracy and the shared values that drive our everyday endeavor. Together, let us illuminate the way forward, ensuring that the flame of democracy burns ever brighter. Ten years ago, the idea of an Asia Democracy Network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force spanning over 30 countries in Asia. Through the support and solidarity of our members and partners, our journey has been a testament to resilience and unwavering dedication to a brighter future. A network that was started to celebrate and sustain the democracy wins of Asia has now become a vital space for advocates to gather in solidarity to defend against the regression of democracy. Despite the challenges encountered along the way and what waits for us in the future, our commitment to the development of inclusive governance, human rights, equality, and the promotion of free and fair elections remains steadfast. ADN has prioritized regional solidarity building through building consolidation and consensus on the national level and prioritizing youth leadership and movement cultivation. As we reflect on our milestones and the path ahead, we invite you to join us in our commitment to democracy and the shared values that drive our everyday endeavor. Together, let us illuminate the way forward, ensuring that the flame of democracy burns ever brighter. Ten years ago, the idea of an Asia Democracy Network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force spanning over 30 countries in Asia. Through the support and solidarity of our members and partners, our journey has been a testament to resilience and unwavering dedication to a brighter future. A network that was started to celebrate and sustain the democracy wins of Asia has now become a vital space for advocates to gather in solidarity to defend against the regression of democracy. Despite the challenges encountered along the way and what waits for us in the future, our commitment to the development of inclusive governance, human rights, equality, and the promotion of free and fair elections remains steadfast. 
ADN has prioritized regional solidarity building through building consolidation and consensus on the national level and prioritizing youth leadership and movement cultivation. As we reflect on our milestones and the path ahead, we invite you to join us in our commitment to democracy and the shared values that drive our everyday endeavor. Together, let us illuminate the way forward, ensuring that the flame of democracy burns ever brighter. Ten years ago, the idea of an Asia Democracy Network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force spanning over 30 countries in Asia. Through the support and solidarity of our members and partners, our journey has been a testament to resilience and unwavering dedication to a brighter future. A network that was started to celebrate and sustain the democracy wins of Asia has now become a vital space for advocates to gather in solidarity to defend against the regression of democracy. Despite the challenges encountered along the way and what waits for us in the future, our commitment to the development of inclusive governance, human rights, equality, and the promotion of free and fair elections remains steadfast. ADN has prioritized regional solidarity building through building consolidation and consensus on the national level and prioritizing youth leadership and movement cultivation. As we reflect on our milestones and the path ahead, we invite you to join us in our commitment to democracy and the shared values that drive our everyday endeavor. Together, let us illuminate the way forward, ensuring that the flame of democracy burns ever brighter. Ten years ago, the idea of an Asia Democracy Network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force spanning over 30 countries in Asia. Through the support and solidarity of our members and partners, our journey has been a testament to resilience and unwavering dedication to a brighter future. A network that was started to celebrate and sustain the democracy wins of Asia has now become a vital space for advocates to gather in solidarity to defend against the regression of democracy. Despite the challenges encountered along the way and what waits for us in the future, our commitment to the development of inclusive governance, human rights, equality, and the promotion of free and fair elections remains steadfast. ADN has prioritized regional solidarity building through building consolidation and consensus on the national level and prioritizing youth leadership and movement cultivation. As we reflect on our milestones and the path ahead, we invite you to join us in our commitment to democracy and the shared values that drive our everyday endeavor. Together, let us illuminate the way forward, ensuring that the flame of democracy burns ever brighter.
10 years ago, the idea of an Asia democracy network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force spanning over 30 countries in Asia. Through the support and solidarity of our members and partners, our journey has been a testament to resilience and unwavering dedication to a brighter future. A network that was started to celebrate and sustain the democracy wins of Asia has now become a vital space for advocates to gather in solidarity to defend against the regression of democracy. Despite the challenges encountered along the way and what waits for us in the future, our commitment to the development of inclusive governance, human rights, equality, and the promotion of free and fair elections remains steadfast. ADN has prioritized regional solidarity building through building consolidation and consensus on the national level and prioritizing youth leadership and movement cultivation. As we reflect on our milestones and the path ahead, we invite you to join us in our commitment to democracy and the shared values that drive our everyday endeavor. Together, let us illuminate the way forward, ensuring that the flame of democracy burns ever brighter. Ten years ago, the idea of an Asia Democracy Network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force spanning over 30 countries in Asia. Through the support and solidarity of our members and partners, our journey has been a testament to resilience and unwavering dedication to a brighter future. A network that was started to celebrate and sustain the democracy wins of Asia has now become a vital space for advocates to gather in solidarity to defend against the regression of democracy. Despite the challenges encountered along the way and what waits for us in the future, our commitment to the development of inclusive governance, human rights, equality, and the promotion of free and fair elections remains steadfast. ADN has prioritized regional solidarity building through building consolidation and consensus on the national level and prioritizing youth leadership and movement cultivation. As we reflect on our milestones and the path ahead, we invite you to join us in our commitment to democracy and the shared values that drive our everyday endeavor. Together, let us illuminate the way forward, ensuring that the flame of democracy burns ever brighter. Ten years ago, the idea of an Asia Democracy Network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force spanning over 30 countries in Asia. Through the support and solidarity of our members and partners, our journey has been a testament to resilience and unwavering dedication to a brighter future. A network that was started to celebrate and sustain the democracy wins of Asia has now become a vital space for advocates to gather in solidarity to defend against the regression of democracy. 
Despite the challenges encountered along the way and what waits for us in the future, our commitment to the development of inclusive governance, human rights, equality, and the promotion of free and fair elections remains steadfast. ADN has prioritized regional solidarity building through building consolidation and consensus on the national level and prioritizing youth leadership and movement cultivation. As we reflect on our milestones and the path ahead, we invite you to join us in our commitment to democracy and the shared values that drive our everyday endeavor. Together, let us illuminate the way forward, ensuring that the flame of democracy burns ever brighter. Ten years ago, the idea of an Asia Democracy Network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force spanning over 30 countries in Asia. Through the support and solidarity of our members and partners, our journey has been a testament to resilience and unwavering dedication to a brighter future. A network that was started to celebrate and sustain the democracy wins of Asia has now become a vital space for advocates to gather in solidarity to defend against the regression of democracy. Despite the challenges encountered along the way and what waits for us in the future, our commitment to the development of inclusive governance, human rights, equality, and the promotion of free and fair elections remains steadfast. ADN has prioritized regional solidarity building through building consolidation and consensus on the national level and prioritizing youth leadership and movement cultivation. As we reflect on our milestones and the path ahead, we invite you to join us in our commitment to democracy and the shared values that drive our everyday endeavor. Together, let us illuminate the way forward, ensuring that the flame of democracy burns ever brighter. Ten years ago, the idea of an Asia Democracy Network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force spanning over 30 countries in Asia. Through the support and solidarity of our members and partners, our journey has been a testament to resilience and unwavering dedication to a brighter future. A network that was started to celebrate and sustain the democracy wins of Asia has now become a vital space for advocates to gather in solidarity to defend against the regression of democracy. Despite the challenges encountered along the way and what waits for us in the future, our commitment to the development of inclusive governance, human rights, equality, and the promotion of free and fair elections remains steadfast. ADN has prioritized regional solidarity building through building consolidation and consensus on the national level and prioritizing youth leadership and movement cultivation. As we reflect on our milestones and the path ahead, we invite you to join us in our commitment to democracy and the shared values that drive our everyday endeavor. Together, let us illuminate the way forward, ensuring that the flame of democracy burns ever brighter.
Ten years ago, the idea of an Asia Democracy Network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force spanning over 30 countries in Asia. Through the support and solidarity of our members and partners, our journey has been a testament to resilience and unwavering dedication to a brighter future. A network that was started to celebrate and sustain the democracy wins of Asia has now become a vital space for advocates to gather in solidarity to defend against the regression of democracy. Despite the challenges encountered along the way and what waits for us in the future, our commitment to the development of inclusive governance, human rights, equality, and the promotion of free and fair elections remains steadfast. ADN has prioritized regional solidarity building through building consolidation and consensus on the national level and prioritizing youth leadership and movement cultivation. As we reflect on our milestones and the path ahead, we invite you to join us in our commitment to democracy and the shared values that drive our everyday endeavor. Together, let us illuminate the way forward, ensuring that the flame of democracy burns ever brighter. Ten years ago, the idea of an Asia Democracy Network emerged into existence from a shared vision of Asian Democrats for a civil society-led network to advocate for and protect democracy in the Asia region. The ADN was officially launched in 2013 in Seoul, Korea, and built on the principles of unity, solidarity, and an unwavering belief in the universality of democracy. Over the past decade, the ADN has evolved into a formidable force.
which is Rice Talk 1, it will be a panel discussion which will be chaired by our friend from the Philippines, uh, Ms. Malu uh, Mangahas. She is a co-founder for the Philipp Philippines Center for Investigation, uh, Investigative Journalism and she's also a host of public affair program on investigative documentaries at GMA Network. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Ms. Malu. Let's put our hands together for Ms. Malu. Hello. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone in uh, the Filipino language. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. But of course, uh, I think we should forbid people getting out because the panel is a very good panel. I'd call my panelists one by one on stage as we probably want to see how this session will go. It's a framework session. For starters, inspired by the presentation this morning of the Ensam, I think we are all here to sing one song, the song of democracy. But sometimes, our notes are failing, the chords are broken, the orchestra has been detained, the concert hall has been padlocked and gripped by fear. I think sometimes we have lost our way in our effort to sing the song of democracy. We're looking at fragile states, failing states, states fraught with challenges. I hope the panel could give us great inputs on what could be common cause common grounds for restoring and strengthening democracy in all our nations. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to welcome our panelists. I'll call them now one by one so we could start our discussion together. First up, Mubashar Hassan, postdoctoral researcher, Department of Cultural Studies and Oriental Languages, a Bangladeshi. Mr. Hassan. Put your hands together. Okay. Where is he? Next up, they'll be putting up chairs so we can have a panel discussion. John Samuel. Oh, okay. So we will ask Mr. Hassan to present first uh, and then call on the three other panelists so that you could appreciate the value of his work. And then we'll sit together in a panel with you. Please listen. You want to go upstairs or? Yeah, yeah, how does it open? Okay. Stand in the middle. It's a lot of attention. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Asia Democracy Network, especially Ichal, uh, providing me with this opportunity to speak in this platform. Um, thank you, Ichal, for always being open to new ideas. And I also acknowledge here Patrick Arl of Diplomacy Training Program, who I consider one of my mentors in my journey of human rights advocacy. <clears throat> I stand here today as a human rights advocate first, who endured and survived enforced disappearance, a crime against humanity in Bangladesh. So, and second, as an academic who is now researching on transnational challenges of democracy activists across the world. I would like to use this platform and opportunity to argue that democracy activists, especially those who have had to flee their countries and living in their exile, are facing a persistent crisis. This crisis of activists um, is also a crisis for democracies. Uh, because many of these activists uh, talk and act for democracies back their home from exile. And we saw Jose Ramos Horta, uh, who spent a significant amount of their time in exile. We know our democracy activists from Myanmar, 
Many of them have to live in exile. So it's a fundamental po problem that we need to talk about. Um, and perhaps there needs to be a broader consensus in the civil society arena now about how best to address the particu this particular crisis of democracy, which is transnational repression and Asian democracy. So before going into the detail, let me put some context in which we are talking today. So if, as you can see from this slide, um, this is a report from 2022 Freedom House report. And you could see that global freedom faces a dire threat around the world. The enemies of democracy, a form of self-government, government in which human rights are recognized, and every individual is entitled to equal treatment under the law, are accelerating their attacks. And as you can see from this slide, that there is no region left where uh, you know, challengers of democracy, or we call autocracies, have not been able to establish their control. So we live in a time where eight in 10 people lived in a place which is partly free or not free. So freedom is precious at this moment. And I also acknowledge, want to acknowledge that we are celebrating 75th anniversary of Universal Declaration of Human Rights this year, which was drafted 75 years ago with a hope that the power of the Universal Declaration and the power of these ideas will change the world and in inspire us towards a world that will ensure that all people can gain freedom, equality, and dignity. So obviously from this slide you can see that we have a long way to go. Um, and what this situation means for human rights advocates and democracy advocates living in countries and who are not being able to work from their countries. It means that I'm, I'm sure we're, we're going to talk hear a lot about it in the coming day. It means shrinking of civil society spaces, imprisonment, assassination, and intimidation of activists and political opponents at home, whereas many activists and supporters of democracies, including journalists, researchers, human rights advocates, critics, and political opponents needed to flee their home country. But once they flee their home country, are they safe? Are they able to persist their work? Um, you know, many of them leave their home country, but do not shut their mouth, do not stop their work. Because to those who live abroad and work from exile, they know that how precious freedom is back to their home. Um, and they assume that they could safely persist their work for democracy and freedom in, from exile, but that's not the case. So I don't know what is the message here in this screen, if I, all right. So that brings to my cross-border issue of transnational repression, which is on the rise. As you can see, um, what is transnational repression? Transnational repression is when government use threats and violence um, to silence dissenters who live abroad. And it is from Freedom of Data from 2014, you could see that they recorded 854 direct physical incidents of transnational repression committed by 38 governments and in 91 countries around the world. And in 2021, Freedom House recorded 79 incidents committed by 20 governments. And one of the interesting aspect and pattern is that these governments are 
learning from each other about how to silence democracy activists and human rights advocates who are living in exile. But are we, a member of civil society and democracy activists, are coordinating with each other in a way that we could resist that suppression? That's the question for the discussion. I also want to highlight, cause, because my current research project is transnational repression, that this Freedom House data does not capture what is written here. If you look into this Facebook status here, it is a status of a mother, of a Bangladeshi journalist who is working from Sweden. And his investigative news site was incredibly effective to expose the governments that are doing bad things in Bangladesh. And if, you, if I just take two minutes to read it, if you could see that a 60-year-old lady living by herself in Bangladesh who have no connection whatsoever what his son is doing in Sweden, He's, she says, at 11.30 p.m. till five minutes ago, the police came to my house and he started to threatening to open the door. I leave alone. I'm not a criminal. My son, Tasnim Khalil, is a Swedish expatriate journalist. My son is not a criminal. Is it my responsibility? Will I have to continue to suffer those harassment due to my son's work over and over? What should I do? And while this statement is very sympathy, you know, very touchy, but I want, also wanted to point out that it's, this sort of harassment is not included in Freedom House data. I had a meeting with them, and they said we can't have that capacity to do, include this, but it is also part of transnational repression. And this brings me to suggest some of the techniques that have been used, and from this slide you could see that there are a lot more countries and what are the tools they use? Assassination, assault through proxy, enforced disappearance, physical intimidation, spyware, Interpol red notice, detention in another country, and rendition. So my point is how to push back. And I want to use this platform to open a discussion with the civil society that what do you think that is the possible way to push back? I just put forward some of the ideas here and you know, you could bring in yours. So is there a possibility that there would be greater north-south collaboration between the civil society and NGOs? Uh, is there a way to record keeping, recognize transnational repression as a credible threat to democracy even in the home country? while activists are living in exile. And, and, the, and, the, and the slide that I showed you, it targets to attack activist dignity. It, you know, threatening their mom means that they want their activists to stop. I mean, who is more closer to a son than mom? And these repression are aimed to target and suppress the free speed of the agencies that left in human body. They couldn't target the human body, they're targeting the mental body and the emotional body of that activist. And it's fundamental issue and fundamental problem with democracy that needs to be talked about. And the final two point is that using Asian as a platform to address the problem, or is there a possibility of Asian joint declaration of CSOs? about transnational repression. And on that note, I thank you for your attention to this topic. Thank you. Great. Excellent work. OK. Thank you, sir. I think we're learning that uh, transnational repression, harassment, murder, disappearances, and killings of uh, democracy defenders has become a transnational crime, aided in large measure by a transnational syndicate of authoritarian leaders. That was Mr. Mubashar Hassan. Next up, we will call on John Samuel, Asia Regional Director of Oxfam International. He will discuss CSO and movement repression. How do we empower CSOs and strengthen movements amid rising authoritarianism and crisis? Mr. Samuel.
Okay. Yeah. Dear friends, comrades and colleagues, I, at the outset itself, I would like to appreciate Asia Democracy Network and the organizers for this particular session. We are living in a very, very interesting part of the history. In 1990s, many of us fought against neoliberalism, globalization and privatizations. Now, we are fighting about neo-illiberalism. There are democratic illiberal states. There are army-led illiberal states. There are one-party states. It's all in Asia in different degrees. Between 1945 and 50, in the post-Second World War, four global consensus emerged. The first one was 1945, United Nations Charter. That's the first time there's a global consensus on human rights, multilateralism, and a much for peace. The second consensus was in 1948, December 10, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The third was about what you call international development cooperation or now we call it different names, overseas development assistance, foreign, uh, you know, Duna and Marshall Plan and all of them. World Bank, IMF also was created part of World Bank's real name was International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. So development became an ideology. And the fourth was a welfare liberal states. And all these things, stand in a crisis in this moment. As I speak now, what's happening in Gaza, we know. What's happening in Ukraine, we know. What's happening in Myanmar, we know. Different minorities, different kinds of people are facing violence of organized state, in the name of war, repressions, etc. The next part of it is, during COVID, we have seen the unprecedented level of surveillance. Not only our health data, wherever we go, we were under surveillance. Vaccination to, it never happened in the history of the world. So we are living in a surveillance era. Our digital re uh, connections, digital footprint, Everything which we do in social media, everything is being under surveillance. As I speak now, this too will be under surveillance. Every word is being watched by somebody. And with the emergence of artificial intelligence, you don't need to, you know, you can watch millions of presentations like this with keywords. So we are living in a very, very unprecedented time. The state are watching. You know, this is a paradox of digital revolution. On the one hand, it connects a lot of us. On the other hand, it also constrains our freedom. It's a very paradox of freedom. On the one hand, we are in an imagined community across nations, across borders, across everything. And there is a freedom to communicate. But on the other hand, the very freedom is constrained by algorithms. What you write, the Facebook and WhatsApp, everybody will decide who should see it, who should not see it, who will watch it. And this is the context. In 1991, we talked about Washington Consensus. That was about liberalization, globalization, privatization with the World Bank and IMF conditionalities. Now it has moved to Beijing consensus. And as I speak now, in the post-1990s after the Berlin Wall, 
there was a celebration of human rights after the Vienna conference. There was a celebration of women's rights after the Beijing conference. And we have talked about social developments. Now what's happening is there's no money for human rights. Foundations after foundations, those foundations who gave money for human rights, they're scared of even the word human rights. Right? I remember Fourth Foundation used to fund human rights and social justice everywhere. Now, if you say human rights, they say we don't understand. And this is happening across the states of the state. There's less money for human rights and democracy. So the international aid architecture is changing very fast. The OECD system developed this very fast because there is more money paid by Asian states. China pays more money to the UN and others. So we are, we are living in a very different thing. What needs to be done? When, you know, civil society, civil society organization and civic spaces are conceptually very different. Sometimes we collapse. Civil society organizations are um, organized, registered entities often. Civil society is the space of citizens, civil and political rights. Civic space is a space where people can come together culturally, socially, and politically, the right to organize, etc. All these things are being constrained. The social movements are being constrained. What needs to be done? I'll just say five things that needs to be done uh, in the future. First, I would say that we all need to invest in a new generation of leaders. All those people, civic leaders, emerged in the 1980s, are in the 70s now, or 80s. They are all, <laughs> generation is retiring. But there are no new generation of people coming to civic space. So there has to be invest in a new generation of liberal leaders. People who live in, believe in democracy, believe in social justice, believe in human rights. And that's very important. That's why I was very happy the young people, you know, shouted slogans here. The hope is there. Number two, more than ever, we need international solidarity. Many people are being jailed. Many people are silenced. And the international, transnational and international solidarity is very important. That's why, you know, Asia Democracy Network is very much relevant. You know, we need support. We need to support each other because people are at the receiving end of unequal and unjust power relationships. The third is to understand advocacy is a marathon, not a sprint. It's not your loud voices that matters. It's your strategic positioning that matters. And you know, there are ways to, we, we cannot have one size fit all. The advocacy which would work in Thailand is different in Cambodia, this is different in Vietnam, it's different in India, different parts. So how do you really do engage, persuade, and resist? As Gandhi said, cooperate where you can, resist where you must. So sometimes making loud voices does not necessarily, you know, you get burned out by shouting. It doesn't solve the issue. Last, civil society organizations need to raise money internally. Stop looking to Europe for answers. Europe itself doesn't have answers. European economy is in shambles, right? You look at UK, you look at Italy, you look at Spain, you look at Greece, there itself there are lots of, look at Hungary, <laughs> there is a neoconservative right-wing emergence even in Europe. So liberalism is not only in crisis here, but in Europe. So we need to raise money in our own places. We need to move back to the old voluntary action before the donors pushed in money and we need to reinvent voluntary action and volunteerism everywhere. So the answer is not one size fits all. The answers in Thailand would not serve Philippines. And you know, when you say it is a spectrum, 
It's not black and white when you call civil society and civic spaces. There are areas where we can speak smartly and strategically, but there are areas where we cannot. Sometimes the language of SDG self, in sort of democracies, you say that we work on SDG 16. So how do you frame the language in different contexts? You know, politics is also language. It is not to co-opted. It is not to compromise. It's how do we strategically position? How do we strategically engage, persuade, but also resist? And this strategy cannot be a global strategy. It cannot be, it has to be contextual. The last but not the least, most of the states, the powerful state in Asia has become unilateral, <laughs> and at best bilateral. They don't listen to anybody. And what is the problem for human rights? The old human rights advocacy doesn't uh, help because it was about naming and shaming. We are now ruled by people who neither have <laughs> name or shame. They are not bothered about, you know, just calling names. So we need to have a very different way of doing human rights advocacy and supporting human rights defenders everywhere. And injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So if it's injustice happening in Gaza, stand up and speak. And the last thing is the, the Protestant pastor said, first they came for you know, trade unions, I was not a trade union. Then they came for communists, I was not a communist. <laughs> then they came for, you know, others, social democrats, I was not a social. And then they came for me, there was nobody else to speak. So despite everything, stand up for justice. Because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice. Democracy is not a commodity. Democracy is not a means. It's about the celebration of freedom and expansion of freedom to improve our capability is development. That's human development. So human development and democracy are two sides of the same coin. And this will have meaning when there is justice. Let justice ring bell everywhere. Let freedom ring bell everywhere. Let's stand up for justice, freedom, and equality everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Samuel. So did you get the memo? You're in, you have to sign up for a marathon, not a sprint, okay? So I think it is from one toolkit that we should carry to defend human rights, defending human rights everywhere in the world. And I think I like the point that he said, we should engage, collaborate, but also resist. Very good point. Next up, we will speak, we will listen to Asad Baig, Executive Director of Media Matters for Democracy. He will talk about yet another problem, yet another Goliath. How can we rise above misinformation and disinformation and how has this affected democratic processes? Asad, are you up here already? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Very happy to be here. Uh, uh, I enjoyed the protest this morning. I hope you all did. Uh, so my name is Asad Beg, and uh, I'm the executive director of uh, Media Matters for Democracy, which is Pakistan's, uh, one of Pakistan's leading media development organizations. And in addition to my very boring role of writing narrative reports and uh, financial reports, I'm also a programmer and a journalist. And so what I've done is we have figured out some ways of quote unquote investigating disinformation on social media platforms. So in the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk about what disinformation is and how it affects the democratic processes, right? So you must have heard that uh, you know, phrase, information is power, right? So somebody took that phrase and they turned that power into the kind of menace which we call disinformation, which is a weapon both stealth and a weapon of mass destruction essentially, which can be used to target uh, human rights defenders like my colleague Mubasha was talking about. It can be used to target CSOs right from the comfort of your own home. And essentially what it does is that it helps Crowdsource violence, a term we have coined ourselves. Crowdsource violence, and you only need to paint a target on somebody's back by, let's say, 
trending a hashtag or sharing a quote-unquote deep fake or generative image of somebody doing something which they haven't done obviously before. And the crowd will quote-unquote deal with it, right? So I'm gonna start with a story uh, of uh, the US presidential election of 2016, which in my view is one of the greatest examples of how misinformation can affect democratic processes. Now stay with me on this, this is very interesting. So firstly, in 2016 in the American elections, there were reports upon reports that this was perhaps the one election which saw most amount of misinformation on social media platforms and so on, right? Ohio University, I remember, uh, conducted a report, a research report, they published it, said substantial impact was gauged of misinf digital misinformation on the voters' behavior. And then, uh, you know, there were various others who came up with similar reports, right? Now, one would think that this must be the kind of work of an other superpower, right? Then BuzzFeed found out that top 20 hoax stories, like top 20 false stories, false stories like Pope has endorsed Trump or Michelle Obama was a man, actually generated more traffic on Facebook than the 20 stories from the credible media houses combined, which by the way includes the NY Times and Washington Post. All of them combined could not beat the misinformation, the false stories that were coming out in 2016 elections. And you'll be surprised, right? So one would think that it's such a big traffic, right? About 10 million uh, in, uh, engagement on Facebook in a mere couple of months before the elections. Must be a massive infrastructure in place, right? Creating all of these stories and kind of feeding them to the American population and so on. Do you know where they were coming from? There's this town called Wellis. A substantial amount of stories were coming from Wellis. How many people in this room has, have heard about Wellis, a town in Macedonia? I'm sure a, if you try to put your finger on a map, you'll have a considerably difficult time pointing out the, the town and the map, right? So nobody has heard about it. And then again, you know, you would think that there must be some global conspiracy happening in Wellis, right? No. There were, Wellis is essentially a former factory town which has a youth bulge and young people who are semi-educated, who can write English, and who are also creative. And they thought, hmm, I think it'll be interesting to write stories about American politics and give American population what they want to read. And that's exactly what they did. And guess what? Their mentor, Miko, he says that 1,200 of his students were earning more than $10,000 per month. And we are talking about a town in Macedonia, right? Per month, not a year, per month, right? So this is the kind of threat we, when we are talking about. We are not talking about states. We are not talking about terror groups. Imagine this kind of power ended up, ending up with a resourceful state. Can you imagine what the state can do as opposed to these young people who are just trying to earn some easy money? Can you imagine the kind of, a, the kind of damage a terror group can do with this, this, this weapon, quote unquote, right? And this kind of brings me to the other part of it. Is, this is only a fraction of the threat that we are talking about. When we, when we say MDM or misinformation, disinformation, more information, that's quite a mouthful, so we just call it MDM. When we say MDM, let me tell you what it can do. Essentially what we are talking about here is <clears throat> a profit-making machinery for most of the actors involved. Now, right, we found out that people in Wallace were earning money. Can, can you guess who else in this equation were getting profits out of the misinformation? Anybody? The companies, thank you, the social media companies. We found out that the traffic that these misinformation stories were generating, they were basically giving massive amounts of profits to the social media companies. And whatever doubts we had, whatever benefits of doubts that we could give to social media companies, they were gone after the publication of Facebook papers, when Francis Hogan came forward. And we found out how profit is actually given precedence over every else, everything else in the social media companies. So this is, when you say Goliath, this is, what, this is one of the Goliaths we are talking about. Right? What we call, lovingly rather call the big tech uh, of, of the world, right? 
So what are we talking about here? We are talking about here AI-based algorithms, which are A, amplifying hate. They are very intentionally, researchers have amply shown that the algorithms are very actively amplifying hateful content. What happened in Myanmar, for instance, at the role of Facebook is very obvious, number one. Number two, we found out by the Facebook papers that the social media companies, the kind of responsibility they need to put in in terms of moderating this hateful content, they don't have a fraction of that. And number three, whatever happens, it doesn't matter, the bottom line matters, as Frances herself very elaborately talked about it. <clears throat> and on top of that, what is happening is the newsrooms, you know, this, the, the entities that we thought uh, would publish credible information, newsrooms across the world, they're dying. And you know why? Because the social media companies are gradually taking over all of the digital ad revenue. In Pakistan, for instance, Three years ago, 79%, three years ago, 79% of the revenue, the digital ad revenue was going to just two companies, Meta and Google. Now it's 87% that is just taken by Meta and Google. Can you imagine uh, what the newsrooms are doing? So essentially we are, in a, we are living in an environment where the newsrooms are dying, so the credible information, you know, you know what's happening to it. Number two, the, the Goliaths, you know, what we call big tech, they're essentially taking over you know, the market. And most importantly, three, this culture of influencer-based journalism is taking over the world, you know, at the lack of a better word, by surprise. In Pakistan, we recently conducted a study and we found out 64% of the people, young people mostly, are now not tuning into any form of digital or traditional media outlets. They are getting their news from where? Social media influencers. And similarly, there was a research published by Reuters, although it was contested by Maria Ressa, but generally we have an idea that a massive majority indicated that they are getting their news from influ influencers. So who are these people influencers? In Pakistan, we call them YouTubers. You know why? Because they are essentially not journalists. What they're doing at best is political commentary, but they're selling that as journalism. And no surprises that it's completely rife with misinformation. So in a way, Big tech is not just taking over, they're actually making the production, the process of production of misinformation or MDM profitable for all parties involved, right? Anyway, so this, this is quite enough. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think I've painted the, the, you know, the end of the world scenario very well. So, I, you know, coming to the recommendations, what needs to be done? Number one, I think the corporate account, the term corporate accountability will have to take the new meaning. In, in, in countries like Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, digital policy making is usually approached from the standpoint of fear, the fear of unknown, the fear of you know, what people would say, the fear of expression, the fear of freedoms, media freedoms, and so on, right? And in a way, what that process does is that empowers big tech. So in Pakistan, for instance, Facebook doesn't even bother to meet us now, or any digital rights activists. They just go and meet the governments because power attracts power. So they, you know, and so is TikTok, and so are uh, most of other platforms, right? So there has to be digital policy making from the prospect of protections framework and human rights framework, not from the standpoint of fear as, as it's happening right now, number one. And this, there have been various talks on it, multi-stakeholderism approach is missing in most of these policy making practices, uh, specifically in countries like Pakistan and India, Bangladesh, and so on and so forth, so it has to be uh, there, uh, most of the systems that AI uh, or social media companies have, they're what we call black box systems, right? So there is basically no way of knowing what's happening inside them. So there has to be a civil society, which brings me to my second point, that the civil society will have to stand up and make alliances regionally, locally, internationally, mostly in the South Asian countries and the global South in general, to make the social media companies accountable and demand uh, more transparency in their systems. Right? And finally, <clears throat> this culture of information gatekeeping, which is not a great term, but the culture of publication of credible information, let's just say that, which the traditional media was very nicely doing, that needs to be restored. A balance, a level playing field for newsroom across the world 
has to be done. For some countries are experimenting it. Australia, for instance, they, they experimented by taxing the, uh, you know, the social media companies. The Canada is trying their own. The, U, the, the UK is trying their own strategies. Whatever works needs to be done to provide more space for the media and independent journalism entities. And finally, and also lastly, and this is perhaps the most important that the governments need to do, any, anyone from the, uh, you know, who has any influence in the parliament or any parliament in this room really need to listen to this. We need to inoculate the masses. And this, I cannot stress enough on this. We need to inoculate the masses. We need to inoculate and educate the people, the citizens of our own country, for uh, political disinformation. Now, it's a very boring, it's a very tedious process, but this has to be done. There are uh, many innovations done in the world. Gamification of inoculation, for instance, is, is, you know, is happening. There are many games uh, for children, for young people, and so on and so forth. But this, the process in inoculation, by the way, who don't, you know, people who uh, don't know inoculation, inoculation essentially is the idea of making sure that the citizens have an understanding of how misinformation works and they're kind of, quote unquote, immune to it. So these are some of the recommendations. But whatever happens, we need to understand that misinformation probably is uh, currently also, but is going to rise as one of the greatest global risk of the world. Already we see misinformation is being weaponized to target journalists, human rights defenders, people uh, who matter in any way or manner. And one of the, the cross-cutting uh, sort of findings, and this is the last point, one of the cross-cutting findings that we find out, uh, and, and we constantly find when we, when we are investigating disinformation, is that the misinformation is gendered, A, which, which essentially means that it's almost always targeted at women, be it the political you know, leaders or journalists or human rights defenders, and B, it's almost always on the, the most harmful uh, misinformation and the most likely that is to create violence is, is, a, is what we call religio-political misinformation. Uh, so yeah, unless we do this, I think it's, it's gonna be very difficult to tackle misinformation. More importantly, the governments will going to have a very clean bill to come up with all sorts of draconian laws to counter quote-unquote misinformation and in that process increase their own political control over the internet. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Assad. Uh, Mr. Baig is the executive director of Media Matters for Democracy. So it was very important notice that you know we have to confront a multiverse of disinformation and misinformation and influence operations. And more sadly, when politicians take over and converge with the interests of big corporates, we have a lot of rebranding. And so we elect not exactly the best leaders. Next up, we have Ms. Cynthia Gabriel, Senior Advisor, Center to Combat Corruption and Cronyism, or C4, based out of Malaysia. She will talk about corruption. How can we ever stop it? How do we demand accountability? Ms. Cynthia? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to Ichal and the ADN for this opportunity and for including anti-corruption into the discourse for democracy. I wanted to talk to you about the last 10 years or so, maybe eight, nine, 10 years of how I actually moved from uh, working on human rights, democracy, to actually focusing on anti-corruption work. And thank you also to the former prime minister of ours. I am from Malaysia, and he had actually contributed to one of the largest financial heists in the world. And we had a fairly small economy in the Far East, but our taxpayers' money had actually flown all the way to Hollywood. We actually contributed unknowingly to making this really awesome movie called The Wolf on Wall Street, where Leonardo DiCaprio was acting. And we found out through a lot of difficult uh, ways and parts that Malaysian tax people's money was actually stolen by our prime minister and his henchmen uh, 
and move the money around, uh, a lot of financial secrecy, offshore accounts. He was actually trying to stifle dissent. Uh, I actually have friends here from the Bursay movement, uh, Maria Chin, Mandip, all these are former leaders of the People's Movement who actually forced a change of government after 61 long years in power. So for that, I think that was democracy working awesome uh, through a lot of hardship. I know we went through tear gas. There were some of us who were arrested more than once, I think six, seven, eight times, and how it actually impacted on our rights and definitely on our democratic institutions. So this is what I am going to actually talk about in the next couple of minutes and to actually talk about how corruption has its devastating impact and effects on human rights, on democracy, and definitely on the quality of our lives. It kills us also, as we also found out from several of our corruption scandals in Malaysia and in different countries, that when push comes to shove, lives don't matter because powerful people will do whatever within their means to hold on to power. And there is an intricate connection between power, money, and greed. And I think the question that I want to put on the table is how are we as democracy activists going to actually play our part to make governments more accountable, give us that space to provide more uh, momentum for our fight for better democracy. Okay, so I've said some things already about the intricate link. And this is one thing that we realized when we were struggling with the uh, 1MDB scandal in Malaysia, is that we were having street protests uh, weekend after weekend. And it's not something common in Malaysian culture to actually go out to the street and come in droves. We're a very comfortable kind of society, you know? We are multiracial. We're always taught to not incite uh, the anger and to not incite uh, uh, people to actually disrupt the racial kind of harmony that we have been uh, able to enjoy for some time. But when things got really out of hand, and the Department of Justice in the United States started releasing information about the stolen property and the money that was actually parked in Los Angeles, in New York, Washington DC, and so on, that it really made so much, um, it, it became so irrational, and it really made so much um, anger around much of the communities that people were actually coming out to the street. And there was even one rally that we actually stayed overnight. And the police were watching and threatening us to disperse, etc. And that was like huge success. So we were learning from our friends in Indonesia, in Philippines, how to do things better on the people's side. In Thailand, and how to actually uh, become brave and courageous. But one of the things we also learned, and I learned from this whole thing about national service around trying to get our prime minister and his henchmen to be accountable, was that we needed to step up and scale up and actually follow the money. We actually needed to call out authoritarian governments. We needed to show that they were operating on power, on money, and greed, and that they were operating on money politics. But it was not enough to actually just say these things without building on our case studies, without building on our body of evidence, and without building on information that was really relevant to go out there to seek information, to demand information, and to also name and shame if it came to it. And we know that it's been so powerful in some countries that at different points in time, we've seen protests in South Korea, for example, where a president was toppled because of a corruption scandal. 
in Maldives, where there was an uh, electoral change because of uh, promises for better government. In Malaysia, after 60 years. In Indonesia, of course, during the reformacy period. In Sri Lanka, as we've seen. And of course, in Pakistan, it has become like a game. Um, and that anti-corruption uh, laws are actually used to silence opposition, to send uh, politicians to jail, and so on. So this is where I think we, I'm hoping we can actually have a better discourse around the effects of poor governance, which at the end of the spectrum is how corrupt politicians actually ap operate, and where does it matter for us as uh, Democrats. So, money politics, political financing, and the pursuit of power is where I believe we need to scale up a lot on the information end. We are also looking at issues of disinformation, uh, fake news, and a lot of different approaches in influencing public opinion. And this is really important for us to actually look at how we can use data. So there's one effort that we're taking on at the Southeast Asian level, where civil society journalists are coming together to actually look at how to use open data uh, by building case studies. Uh, sometimes it's easier to look at local government initiatives because it affects our quality of life very directly, whether it's about potholes in the road or actually uh, changing street lights, uh, garbage collection, etc. that we can actually develop uh, apps, we can actually use websites, we can pers pursue accountability in a way that can build on open data initiatives. So this is actually something which is very much linked to how democracy at the local level can work uh, much better. But at the bigger level, at the national level, we have seen through our scandals in, in Malaysia, for example, how political financing had actually contributed to winning elections. And it was bizarre when former Prime Minister Najib actually admitted that some amount of the 1MDB money that was missing was actually utilized to support the, the what you call the chabang, the, the grassroots uh, communities that are linked to his political party to provide financing for them uh, to carry out political activities. So. What, what was taxpayers' money being used to fund uh, election machineries, etc., was actually admitted openly by a former prime minister. And this is actually something that he had uh, revealed uh, during investigations and so on. So it's information like this that we probably need to build to connect the dots to show that elections are often won. And Malaysia is no... Uh, exception. It is like something which commonly happens that we know political financing is built on financial secrecy, on illicit finance, and oftentimes it is also about interference by uh, other stronger governments that want to see a certain kind of government take place and operate in uh, third world nations. Okay. Now, I just wanted to go into two very specific things about where I think we should be also trying to build a little bit of focus in our democracy building work. It's about awarding of contracts. And we know that our procurement system in most of our countries are secret. Uh, it is often rotten because uh, many people believe that corruption is needed to grease the wheel when uh, doing business. And if any of us in the room are actually business owners or business people, uh, or when you talk to corporate leaders, etc., you will hear this thing about um, if you want to get a license or if you want to get a permit, uh, there's no choice. You just have to pay a bribe. You just have to get the license going by uh, paying the 
public service a little bit more money to get your permits, etc. And then when that is done, you often see that there's a racism element involved in certain contexts where racism actually fuels the culture of entitlement, like in the case of Malaysia, and special privileges enabling uh, poor governance and corrupt initiatives. So everywhere we have seen that um, in some contexts, uh, many of us NGO activists, civil society activists, human rights activists don't actually incorporate the math, the economics behind how contracts are awarded. Uh, what does it mean to actually demand for the right to information on uh, where our tax money is actually being allocated and for what? And who actually gets these contracts are actually very important. So are they cronies of the government of the day? Or are they relatives or brother, sister, uncle, auntie of a particular politician? Or is it who you know rather than whether you can do the job? And these are very important things that I believe we need to actually fix in the government that we're talking about a uh, government that is authoritarian, a government that is refusing to let us speak up uh, on our rights. Because the more information we know, the more we can actually call out a whole lot of different uh, issues around strengthening transparency, openness, and accountability in government. Now, that's one very um, critical um, area in which the vulnerability of victims become very real. I mean, there are wars now in place. I mean, we, we know about the Israel-Palestine conflict, which has become so crushingly devastating. Ukraine, Russia, and more closer to home, Myanmar. But where is it that the arms trade is being fueled by, by uh, corruption and governance? And this is the case, I've actually listed two cases. One is the case by one of the British largest arms uh, deals with uh, the Middle East, uh, where Offshore companies, shell companies, and bribe payments were actually issued to uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, royal family. It is uh, something that is already published, so I don't think there will be a slap suit on me for saying this. Uh, and the Scorpion case, which actually involved two French uh, submarines, and a Mongolian woman was also killed in the process because she had threatened to give out information on the prime minister and his um, uh, former prime minister and his connection. But there are many, many more cases of how the arms trade is being fueled by profiteering. Now, I want to actually know how many of us actually try to look and follow the money. This is very difficult. This is really difficult. How are we going to get data around uh, arms? But some information is already out there from the budget on defense deals and how is it that we can actually trace uh, the finances of uh, how our uh, defense strategy is actually working. Okay, so this is where I wanted to stress that corruption is not a victimless crime. It's really something that puts us in a very vulnerable situation. It diverts resources and it also makes powerful governments even more powerful. So in the last few slides, it's about talking strategies to hold the powerful people to account. And power is often accompanied by money and greed. And I was just out from a whistleblowing human rights defenders forum in uh, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia last uh, two weeks ago. And there were a lot of conversations around protection for journalists who expose corruption scandals, protection for whistleblowers, protection for human rights defenders. 
and how are we going to scale up the protection as we develop more data to name and shame? And I think one of the things we also wanted to talk about is around uh, the reforms of uh, using artificial intelligence to support our work in promoting good governance, fighting corruption, and developing uh, democracy initiatives. So in conclusion, uh, these are some reforms taking place in Malaysia after the change of government. It is really very difficult, even with a more reformist, purportedly more reformist prime minister in place, we are not really seeing any uh, fast forward reforms in progress. Uh, we're talking about transparency in public procurement, access to information, protection for whistleblowers, and corporate transparency. I wanted to stress on corporate transparency because in our bad experience of looking at how money was sent through uh, offshore accounts and shell companies, uh, we now have a, a Companies Act which has been amended to include beneficial ownership, which means you can no longer have proxies representing companies to actually move government money around. And the SDGs goal 16, five out of the 10 um, points for uh, realization of goal 16 center around corruption. Transnational crimes, 16.4 illicit financial flows, 16.5, corruption and bribery. 16.6, accountable institutions. 16.7, inclusive decision making and access to information, 16.10. And in my last comments, it is actually to say that uh, many people are afraid to link corruption discourse in SDG Goal 16, especially so in uh, Malaysia. And I think it's really about time that we face the fact that if there is corruption, there will be absolutely uh, uh, difficult ways in which we can actually realize uh, the sustainable goals and the right to development. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay, corruption is not a victimless crime. We're calling all the panelists on stage shortly, but in the meantime, Please uh, indulge me with some promotional info about a book that uh, Asia Democracy Network launched last June. It's called The China Gambit. Actually, I was part of a team of researchers from the four countries that looked at the role of China across multiple platforms, economic, political, social, security, and cultural offensives of China. The four countries being Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Fiji. It must be noted that in this book, we tried to produce a seminal report on, and connected the dots on what exactly has China done in these four countries at a time when their governments were actually being criticized for being undemocratic, for human rights violations, for authoritarian rule. So we had Duterte in the Philippines, uh, the Prayuth Junta in Thailand, Jokowi on his second term. Let me just uh, actually put this as an added input to exogenous influences across borders that may be important to look at. You are aware that in the last uh, decade, China has promoted its Belt and Road Initiative that supposedly consists of a U.S. trillion dollars or eight trillion dollars worth of investments. Actually, all the four countries benefited in large measure from Belt and Road Initiative projects and uh, loans. The leaders of the four countries were more than willing to accept China's helping hand because this was also the period when the four governments launched massive, massive economic development plans. Uh, High-speed railway, our build, build, build program in the Philippines. And this is also the period when in the case of uh, the four countries, similarly, China really invested heavily in terms of loans, uh, grants, and investments. The important thing to note here is that uh, the gambit has been played by both national actors and China's, the Communist Party of China and China's state-owned enterprises. That has not been without cost. 
on the populations, on the environment, on the economic sectors, and on the institutions. But the keenest part of the book, if you will, is what we had noticed to be a very aggressive cultural offensive, soft power deployment of China, of its influence in the four countries, including content sharing programs with media agencies, state and private media, exchange programs, very consistent, very frequent, between and among Chinese journalists, academics, professionals, government personnel, donations of equipment to state media agencies, broadcasts of China programs in state and private media agencies in the four countries, and also the mushrooming of Confucius Institutes and China Friendship Societies in the four countries. We note this to be important because they also come with uh, what we call diplomacy by China's ambassadors and diplomatic personnel, ambassadors even running columns in national newspapers in the four countries. This also comes with MOUs, memos of agreement between China's political party and political parties in some of the four countries. Now, ICT is one other area that probably has scoped the critique of many of our academics and researchers, but very aggressive initiatives to organize smart cities powered by Huawei and the training of government personnel by China ICT personnel. But most important of all, we see the legislation of uh, data privacy and digital security laws in the four countries and the insistence that the partner states should embrace the one China policy and keep silent on or censor reports on Beijing's actions in Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Tibet, and Taiwan unless they want to lose China's favor and tons of aid. This is the China Gambit, actually. The book is called China Gambit. And as in a gambit, in war or in peace, it is actually playing between an exogenous state, external to the four countries, and also the political and economic elite of the four countries. I hope you get to check it out on the ADN website. Thank you very much. Now we'll call on the four panelists for your open forum. That was just a bonus that ADN wanted to add. Can we ask Cynthia, Mrs. Samuel? Yeah. Okay. Are you ready? I think you have a lot of questions already. The, this session has been titled Conquering Goliaths, okay? And the focus on four border, cross-border issues. And I think it's important to note that the four panelists had focused each on specific Goliath to conquer, namely transnational repression by Mr. Hassan Samuel on how CSOs had also been the subject of a lot of pressure in times of crisis and war and conflict. Mr. Baig, who looked at disinformation and misinformation, and also Miss Cynthia, how do we deal with corruption, slay it, and demand accountability? Questions from the floor? Or would you like to ask each other questions? Not anymore. <laughs> do we have questions from the participants? I see a hand raised there. Please introduce yourself and then Quickly state your question so we could gather more comments. Name and then country and designation, please. I am Pradeep Besak. I work with Global Call to Action Against Poverty in GCAP Asia. I'm the Asia coordinator. Did you hear? This question is for uh, our Pakistani friend. Look. Can you <coughs> come closer to the microphone, please? Yeah. Okay, yes. now it's audible. Okay. So, on misinformation. Um, Look, I, I have been, uh, you gave mostly Asia examples, but I am hearing from across the globe. There's a new phenomenon 
<coughs> you gave some solutions, I don't know how they will work. The, the, the political parties have been immensely benefited from this misinformation, right? And uh, don't think that citizens are not uh, happy with this. Uh, sorry, are very unhappy with this. They are also quite happy with this, right? If I'm somebody, I had somebody, this is the way I, you know, ex ex um, you, uh, you vent out your uh, hatredness. That's, that's the reason why this has caught the limelight. Um, um, Excuse me, the question is directed at who in particular? To, to our Pakistani friend, Beg. Yeah, uh, Mr. Beg. Okay. So, in the in the, in the era where uh, money matters, uh, this this I I think is going to rule. I honestly do not see an end to this unless ethics actually the, the old ethics where we 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 adhere to ethics and profit did never matter to us. All right. Uh, but uh, now now things have changed. Uh, um, I don't know, you have given the answers, I have, I'm not uh, very hopeful. Okay, so question Respond is... Respond to it now? Did you get it? Yeah, yeah. All right. Mo so most of it, most of it. Are there <coughs> questions? Yeah, you want to respond quickly? Yes, very quickly. This is probably the first and the last time I'm going to quote Mark Zuckerberg, that they're going to get better and will have to get better at it, right? So we're basically competing with the disinformation producers. As a person who has been investigating disinformation, I can tell you just for sure that most of the, like I said in my presentation, most of the parties involved in this equation, they're getting profit out of it, right? So how do you fight something like this? By building alliances. So for instance, one of the things we are doing is uh, training the mainstream media to investigate disinformation. And by doing that, bringing all those actors, the money, like my colleague was pointing out, in the light, right? All of the black economy that is being poured into the disinformation production into the light. Where is that money coming from? You know, and so on. So in that process, you highlight the things which actually matter to a lot of people. So for instance, it, it'll, you know, it'll really matter to me if my tax-paying money is actually being used to buy, buy let's say, a state to hire <clears throat> or make a force of disinformation right. producers to target their political opponents, right? So in that way, alliances are extremely important. And one of the biggest stakeholders in this process, I feel, is the independent journalism media which can essentially be used to uncover some of these stories and bring them to light and show the people how their own money are being used against them. Okay, yeah. So, yes, please, weigh in, yes. Can we actually follow the money in terms of this, uh, this information campaigns? I think, you know, it's very important to understand there is misinformation. There is the post-truth era. There are lots of state agencies and non-state agencies and corporates do that. But also there is a, we need to understand there is a counter discourse happening. There are lots of young people uh, run YouTube channels, tell this, there are lots of people um, also run alternate media. Lots of young people do that. I do it on an everyday basis. So it's not something which, you know, as you know that the world is moving to post truth era, you know, all these big media, Google and Facebook, but also there are spaces for counteraction. And this is where uh, Asia Democracy Network, something which we are doing is called Civic Asia. It's a digital platform for young people across Asia, around 400 people. They may not use their names also, right? You can have your name. I may not use my name. Yeah, so there are a number of you know, strategies and counter discourses you need to build. One is to give up saying that there is misinformation. And to be honest, there was always misinformation. Right? Weapons of mass destruction didn't come through social uh, media or WhatsApp. It was published by New York Times. Right? Mm -hmm. So media always mm -hmm. was pro establishment, pro corporate. Once it becomes a corporate money-making thing, it has always been advertisement matters, advertorial matters, and we need to create counter-discourse. All right. That's the point. Okay, yeah. Uh, any related questions? Well, I, I do have one quick one. How do you distinguish between the toxic camps of trolls, for and against certain politicians, but also citizens just exercising their freedom of expression? I mean, they cannot be branded, all of them, as trolls. 
uh, you know, I can tell you what we do, for instance. What we have done is we have made uh, what we call a toolkit, quote unquote, of uh, a bunch of things combined that helps us get the data from the big tech, from the social media platforms that most researchers or journalists don't have. And with that, we usually have evidence enough to prove what camp usually they are in. And that, is, and that information is extremely important for the journalists because then they find out if X political party is investing so much in their digital campaigns, then who's funding them? And that arise, you know, give rise to a, a number of other questions and so on and so forth, so which kind of you know, focuses on the transparency. But I'll, I'll, I'll uh, you know, uh, one very quick uh, contribution to what my colleague was saying here. This is extremely important that you keep trying. New York Times published uh, the thing about uh, weapons of mass destruction, but then they also published an apology. You know, why was that? Because of the public pressure. Because, you know, Amanpour uh, came in the public and said, uh, the New York Times wrote an editorial on that, right? So, because of the public pressure, because they wanted to set the record straight and so on. Okay, we have people standing up to ask questions. Yes, please. And then behind you, next up, yes. Yes, I'm a journalist from the Philippines. My name is Marita Sibito. This question is about disinformation. It, it takes off from a loose summary of the China gambit. Uh, I would like to know the experience of Pakistan because there was a China index report which says that Pakistan is the most influenced by disinformation from China. So I'd like to know your experience and how do you fight this information from a foreign actor and a Goliath at that? That's a very interesting question. And this is uh, one of those, perhaps, uh, the oh, ideas. Sorry. Put your mic closer. OK, is it better? OK. So this has been one of those ideas which has been drilled kind of in the people in Pakistan for a while now. So it's, it's not new. But we see that this is being amplified by a lot of uh, digital media platforms. And this is where, when I was talking about the influencer-based quote-unquote journalism. Because people, when a certain influencer comes up with their own theory of why uh, the you know, Belt Road Initiative, for instance, is one of the best things that, have, that that's happening to Pakistan. When they come up with something like that, it may well, might as well be their opinion, but the people buy it as journalism. And all of this process, essentially, is being monetized and being kind of made uh, profitable by the big tech companies, which is ironic because, you know, Facebook and China doesn't really <laughs> sit together well. But then again comes to the, you know, the other issue of the Chinese platforms, TikTok for instance. You know, Pakistan actually, a, a, a TikTok is the second largest platform in Pakistan and I believe very strongly that in the next five years, TikTok will be the leading platform in the country. Right? And yeah, so, and TikTok is also, by the way, very one last point, TikTok is also one of the most compliant platforms, which essentially means that they're most susceptible to taking content offline uh, from their platform on the request of the governments and so on. Next up, yes, we have a question from this end of the room, oh, the middle part of the room. Yes, sir, please, you have a microphone, name and uh, country or designation. Thank you, uh, my name is Ziaul Rahman and I'm from Awaz Center for Development Services, Pakistan. I'm just uh, um, actually trying to highlight the challenges to the democracy instead of information and freedom of expression, though the freedom of expression is also a part of democratic values and culture. Uh, just asking this question to John and to the others, uh, you highlighted that uh, civic civil society organizations and civic rights spaces are in you know uh, danger and shrinking financial spaces and everything yeah that's fine but don't you uh, think that the over the period of time the citizens are also have shown their mistrust upon the civic spaces and civic rights and civic uh, civil society organizations because there is a disengagement of civil society organizations with the civil citizens at large. Their engagement in the political processes, particularly, you know, the engagement with the political parties is lacking. Over the period of time, we have observed that they have shown this mistrust because of the, uh, uh, the um, uh, lack of delivery by the political processes. And somehow, so, uh, mo in most of the uh, countries in South Asia, the democracies are engineered either by the, the, the military or by somehow, you know, we, we have experienced 
the, the pseudo or what we call hybrid regimes all over. So what can we do to engage with the citizens? In fact, particularly I'm asking about the civil society organizations. How we can you know, minimize this gap between citizens and the civil society organizations? Yes, sir. The first thing is, uh, <laughs> deliberately I have not used the word shrinking civil society. Because these are some of those Western, I mean, European narratives which has been done. Tell me, uh, in Cambodia, in Thailand, in Vietnam, in many other places, it's not the civil society which is shrunk, it is the government overreach. Civil society uh, space is still there. Citizens are still there, civic spaces are still there. But there is a new conservative, illiberal governance model, which is at the, which is the issue. As if you know, civil society is something which is just shrunk. No, it's not. The dynamics of power relationships have changed, and we need to make a distinction between NGOs, non-governmental organizations, which receive money, which runs the show and civic spaces, which are citizen spaces. That's one thing. You know, we need to sometimes we collapse all, that's what I say, civil society organization as registered entities under different government law is different from social movements who are unregistered. You know, young people who come and protested here are not registered young people because they just wanted to protest. So they were expressing, asserting their civic space here. In some other countries, I was telling that, they would have been snatched away by the police. So it's very interesting to see how we use different spaces. Now, next thing about citizens. Always people who have been power confirmist. In the history of the world, 80% of the people are power confirmist, especially the midi, uh, uh, middle class. It's always a minority of voices you know, who stand up, right? Okay. So Gandhi stood up in a place of discrimination. It's not the crowd which stand up. It's somebody, when Martin Luther stood up, or when, you know, Mandela went to jail, it's not the middle class. Middle class will go with the flow. It's the, that people who are, have courage of conviction stand up. So I'm saying that it is the civic spaces Civil society and civil society organizations are not conceptually one. There's a conceptual difference. The political process and institutional process are very different. Now, if we are receiving money, there's no money for human rights anymore. Okay. Right? So hence, we need to find the voluntary ways of doing working. We have to, we have to change the, the paradigm of the way we work and engage. That's the point I was Okay. Uh, can I just bring Mr. Hassan and Ms. Gabrielle to the conversation, that comment? I, I, do you have some ideas? Well, the question centered on a, an apparent increasing disconnect between civil society or civil society organizations and citizens. And, and maybe are there areas for improvement in the way CSOs or NGOs are doing their work? Yes, Mr. Hassan. Yes. Quickly, yeah, just join in. So that, that was an interesting question. I think um, we also need to I acknowledge your point of government outreach. And we have, we're seeing that that outreach is also masked in the f framework of civil society. So there are a lot of civil societies in Asia who are actually connected with the government. And out and taking up this space. So in theory, there is civil society shrink, and also not shrink that you said. So it really depends on how you frame it, I guess. But that's a that's a that is an emerging trend, at least in several South Asian countries that we are seeing. All Thank right, Miss Cynthia, anything to add there? Yeah, and then you will quickly. Yes, Miss Cynthia. Anything, any ideas uh, um, on that? I mean, this whole question about civic space uh, is, for me, double-edged. Because one is, I, I don't think any government would 
hand it to us on a silver platter to say, here, uh, please give me your feedback. It doesn't work <laughs> like that. It is about making our um, presence felt and felt in a way that is also uh, valuable uh, for public policy to be shaped in a better way. Uh, so there's some value in engagement uh, and putting forward proposals which are concrete, uh, which means we need to step up the scales on our own uh, oh, capacities right. as well. Okay. But more importantly, it's about pushing the wedge in the door so that the proposals that we want to push in uh, actually gets heard and not dismissed at the door itself. All right. So these are strategies that we need to develop. And I think pushing, push, putting that wedge in the door is the most important. And then when the wedge is there, you push it further so that there will, there will be opportunities to listen to good ideas. Okay, Mr. Samuel, you wanted to add something? In Asia, uncivil societies are increasing. There is civil society and uncivil society. And civil society are based on civic values or citizens' values of freedom, human rights, right to expression, right to association, etc. Uncivil societies are exactly opposite to that. So there are many countries, government is promoting uncivil society with huge funds so when you talk about G20 process, C20 process, it is filled by those pseudo civil society or gongos who pretend as, and they speak all the same languages, what I call mock liberals. They, in this kind of spaces, they speak something. Back in the country, they say how great the leader is. And this double speak is also we need to say even in the our own midst there are people who talk mock liberal language but in the countries they become the enemies of freedom all right wow what a sad commentary we have well the, the gentleman and then uh, miss melinda yes. out yes. against corruption and difficulty of finding evidence all right go the, the risk of uh, finding evidence Ms. Cynthia? Uh, that, that's an excellent uh, question. That I, I think I understand what you're saying. It's like, you know, there's something not right. You smell something fishy, but you don't have enough details to put your case forward. So there are uh, ways in in which, so one of the things I mentioned just now is to use open data. So which means you look for similar cases to what, what you have, and then you build some kind of trail to see whether it's connected to what you are saying. The second is uh, to actually make a formal report with whatever information you know. And there is a process of providing protection, but it's usually false. It's usually not complete, and it will get the whistleblower into some kind of vulnerable situation. But the third is there are tools, tech tools now that we can, that we can use to help uh, detect company profiles. So we actually know uh, the company, for example, that got a contract, uh, who is behind it, All right. uh, whether linked to a politician, whether linked to a tycoon or a big businessman, and then you can draw okay. the dots. Yeah. If you're afraid to put out the information, you can also pass it to a journalist. <coughs> and if the journalist see there's enough data and it's concrete, then maybe they might want to report about it. All right. So I'll there's many ways we can skin the cat. I'll, I'll many personally ways we can get the data caution out. you to be more patient and keep it under the radar. I mean, you don't do a project like that and say it openly. So quiet, plodding work is important. And I think you have to consider all the different possible 
sourcing, quality of evidence, how to put it out, the risks that you're taking, etc. So we'll probably have side discussions in the meantime. Thank you for the question. Ms. Melinda. Thank you. De Jesus from the Philippines Center for Media Freedom and Responsibility. I'd like to ask the panel, anyone, to address the issue of polarization, the fact that we cannot talk to one another anymore caused by technology and basically the political divisions that have been, that have put up the illiberal frameworks in which we all now live. And that is my question, because I think if we are not able to converse and to talk, we are not going to have any kind of democratic moment soon. Okay, so we have 11 minutes to go. Are there other questions related? So question is polarization. How do we deal with it when we're quarreling all the time with the different cups? Uh, more questions and then we ask the panel to respond. Hello. Thank yeah, you. three questions and then we ask them. Please. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you. I'm Dorji. I'm a Tibetan activist, and uh, you have mentioned about the China report, the influence that is growing in terms of transnational repression, and in terms of the Freedom House. Louder, out of please. those cases, fifty percent are China Street directly. So my question, getting back to the core objective, in terms of tackling this transnational repression, we have personally face that, even on those like straight, which, is, which are free right now, but we are facing that. So what civil societies, what mechanism we have in terms of uh, creating this safe space for dissidents and activists. So from your point of view, as you have worked and researched on that, I would like to hear. Okay. Thank you. Remaining areas for civic spaces for uh, activists. And then another question, please. Yes, please introduce yourself and raise your, oh, there's another one there. Hello. Yes, sir, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm just making the comments, not the question. All right, Quick, uh, My name is San Ong, and I'm an elected MP from Obama in 1990 election. Hello, And sir. then from two, uh, 1990 to 2009, I, I was here. Uh, I was in the, uh, in the government. comment, please. And then I settled in Australia, and then 2021, I came back, and I said, okay. I'm now based in Mesot, fighting for the democracy. Okay, then there is the introduction. And the second one is that yeah, so all things and everything uh, or anything you can do uh, for the Obama, uh, it is very grateful yeah, from us. Okay, they are very important. And uh, thank you very much uh, for your assistance and for your support for the democracy in Obama. All right. And okay. the number th three is that uh, there are a lot of okay, so transnational repression in Obama. Okay, for example, yesterday I met with a girl and you know, her sister is in Sydney. Her, yeah, she was a very strong activist. She made an interview, and in Obama, yeah, to her sister's home, they were, they, it okay. was confiscated. She was arrested and so on. The, okay. 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 And in Mesot also, there are a lot of what called the transnational repression. You will remember that three people, yeah, they were what got the repatriated into the hands of the uh, BGF. All right, yeah, thank you, sir. So, we would like to listen to your story, yeah, but yeah, yeah, we're running out yeah. of time. Thank okay, you, so, sir. But, but, no, one thing what I would like to mention is that then uh, what got the 45 right, they made the report, very good report on the repatriation and reform. And also they make another report on the, what got the human rights uh, violations you know, on the migrant workers in Meso. So then you know, the local people, local authorities, they are well known to the issues. All they, right. They we'll we'll so get the I, web links, the URL links to these reports and ask Secretariat to distribute it among the participants. Is that okay? Okay, sir. Thank you. We have another question. Yes, please. Last question. Uh, and a second to last. Yes, please. Uh, good morning. <laughs> Maybe afternoon. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm Kita. Uh, speaking from Thailand, um, maybe sharing a little bit and maybe question. Okay, the quick one. one huh? uh, the first one, we, we, I want to know like uh, how, uh, what you think about scaling up the community to, to, to know about the democracy, a democracy. Because uh, um, I come from the marginalized network, right? We don't know the democracy. We face everyone like a stigma and discrimination every day, right? All right. Like a, how to grow up us 
to know the democracy. Uh, and then today we had 250 person here, right? But I think in the future, we will have like a 2,500 person more and more and more to know. Okay, like a, a thank together. you. All and right. Uh, the, last, uh, the last one is uh, uh, how to affirming our data, like uh, if you know the evidence uh, of the, the, the uh, corruption, the, the everything, but how the governance affirm like uh, they, uh, they okay our data. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Again, on how to put, bring up evidence. And last question, thank gentlemen. You. Yes, yeah. please. I'm thrown from Cambodia. I work for the Kamnazian Youth Future as an LGBT activist. And part of my life is educate people about the rules of law. And I have a very short question is one, I'm among the people here, especially the speakers. I hope that you believe that as I am doing in my home country, mm -hmm. that we believe that only education to the people to make the sustainable and long-term changes in the democracy process. Okay. But I have not heard how you all invest your money, your energy, your capacity to educate people through media, through the civil societies, through the donor. Because okay. back to my country, very few people understand about their own law, their own state law, their own state and religious law. And then they start fighting and then a lot of arresting. Oh, so yeah. how you engage your investment into education in the people to people. Okay. My, last my last question, I'm an LGBT activist, and I have never heard or have and, uh, never been engaged like this forum that an, as an LGBT activist can be uh, bring out the voice of an LGBT to be a democracy process. So how, how your process or, or what is your agenda in the future to engage LGBT into the democracy process? Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank you for the question. So we'll ask our panelists one quick round, multiple pegs, polarization. How do we bridge the discourse? I think quest next question, remaining spaces, civic space for activists. Question about, uh, well, evidence and corruption cases again, but also questions about how about investing in education or putting money after education and making democracy a living concept among communities, especially outside the capitals or among uh, basic sectors. Quick round, gentlemen and lady. Sorry, so those different questions before we close the panel. Thank you, so I've got two questions regarding TR, so I'll, I'll be brief. Number one to our friend from Tibet is that um, I think there is, there is a need for greater awareness, not only within the activist, activist circle, but also from government to government. And you know, Freedom House does not record data that are not physical threat, which is a, which is their, you know, which is a big gap in that, in, in, in that, in that, in that space. Um, and the second one, someone talked about Burma and what I want to put it out there, that we are trying to put out a book on transnational repression, which features uh, a chapter on Burma will be written by someone who is in living in exile. And if any of you are interested to talk about more on that book or the project that I'm doing, please happy to connect after this session. Thank you. I'm sorry, I should just add, how about the LGBTQ plus community? Can they also ever be important voices in uh, human rights, defense, and democratic activism for democracy? Uh, take your pick, uh, gentlemen and lady. We're running out of time. The yeah. question's raised. Point on polarization. And I think polarization is created by the government, uh, the parties in the government itself. Two challenges which we face. One is human rights defenders are seen as anti-nationals. So there's a new nationalist discourse which actually annul the UN charter principles of internationalism. And that's one of the major challenges. How do you create a counter discourse to that? And counter discourse needs to be done, and that is, I think, the role of ADN and others, because this polarization is bound to happen. Because saying that us and them, and them as anti-nationals, us as patriots, 
and this is also language framing and then we need to work on that on the lgbt issue it's it's democratization doesn't happen uh, overnight it's a process that requires lots of attitudinal change societal change and this requires a lot of investment beyond these spaces a lot of public education and many of them happens over a period of time you know in 1974 is the first women's conference now we, many people are not uh, scared of saying that i'm a feminist or feminist leaderships or decolonization so these terms we need to also invent new terms to counter the last uh, from the friend from uh, thailand see advocacy is not a one man show it's a marathon we need to work over time through network get quietly evidence and then hit when the time comes now this i would say adn probably so do uh, you know not only democracy education but advocacy training in a constrained situation and what kind of strategies and tactics will be used and that's what something which adn should be able to do with for democracy all right big task for adn and then i think uh you want to go ahead mr yeah and just uh, uh, I, i think a couple quick, of very I'll, very quick things questions yeah there's uh, so many couldn't agree more with education part unfortunately uh, in most cases education is something which uh, runs in the long haul it doesn't really provide quick results and hence it's not a donor darling what we you know uh, typically uh, see what's happening the other part was polarization uh, what samuel said yes but also we also need to see that uh, are there any implications of uh, artificially intelligent algorithms in terms of amplifying this uh, and how do we tackle that one of the solutions for instance we've been working on is to push for ethical audits of the algorithms and see how they are contributing to the uh, sort of the increase of polarization i uh, I, i think due to lack of time i'll stop here yeah Thank you, Miss Cynthia. Uh, final words. Yes, yeah. uh, I have two suggestions. Uh, one is around expanding our civic space to reach out to very specific target groups like media journalists. Uh, this is to develop investigative capacities, uh, not just around anti-corruption, but also around uh, related issues like militarization, disinformation. uh how to actually report in a way that can develop a uh, strong concrete uh evidence that can actually help civil society organizations map because the mapping is really important in every kind of advocacy and strategy that we plan out number 2 very briefly is to also reach out to uh young lawyers uh and this is very important because we need to start being very strategic in terms of taking up legal cases legal definitions and strategic litigation that can actually improve public participation around uh, shaping policy and uh, demanding that uh, governments actually focus around paradigm for right to information so we know that in several countries like philippines indonesia malaysia just announced also a right to information act we learned a lot from sri lanka uh before uh before the the new wave of uh, uh unsettled uh, situation how the commission actually works the right to information commission and you can actually apply for a lot of uh, government data with an access to information framework which requires a lot of work in building a body of evidence there's no shortcut but it's really about putting the information in place oh, and when we get that we can actually develop better civic uh, space by putting out information that um, is cutting edge and they will have to be forced to listen to us thank all you all right on that note we're ending rice talk one this has been confronting the goliaths borderless challenges we face they talk to you about transnational repression natural social calamities and shrinking civic space misinformation and disinformation corruption and of course the china gambit let us please give a big round of applause to our speakers mr mubashar hassan john samuel Asad Baig, Cynthia Gabriel, thank you very much ladies and gentlemen. Magand maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Thanks lunch time.
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Malu, for moderating. And um, I have two announcements to be made before the third one. Number one, this event is being streamed live through our Facebook and YouTube. But for those, who, uh, those of you, friends, who can't be filmed, and, but you would like to ask question, you can always ask question privately to our uh, speakers, whether for today, now, or even tomorrow. Announcement number two, for those who, of you who can't, uh, because we are taking pictures, but for those of you that your photos can't be published on social media, please reach out to the ADN Secretariat who, has, who is seated behind there, Sue, Karel, Sue Yong, or even me, inform us, so that we will ensure that your photo will not be published online. And the third announcement, which is the most important one, lunch will be served at the, at where you had breakfast in the morning, and please be back by 2 p.m. Thank you.